Um, that was lovely. Um, <laughs> um, I like it when someone says a compliment, but it sounds like they're really saying, he should just shut up sometimes. But yeah, um, I'm going to try and summarise something that took four years worth of time to, in, to 15 minutes, but the last time I did this, it took us an hour, so it might be really quick. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, what is now error message guidance in the gov.uk design system. Um, and I've tried to make this like a story, but it's... It's a story about working in government, so it's, it, it's a bit weird. So I started in HMRC in August 2014, and I was immediately put onto a service called um, Submitting an Employment and Immediate Report, which it was one of the unusual early days services because it didn't exist before. It wasn't like a paper service or like a super old-fashioned service. They'd just written this new law. I'm not going to go into it because the guidance on explaining the legislation is longer than the legislation. It's that complicated. Um, but essentially it boiled down to um, people who find other people's jobs have to do these returns um, and they need to do at least one, one every quarter, so one every three months, um, they've got to fill in this spreadsheet. Well, actually, it's, I shouldn't say spreadsheet, it's a CSV or open document spreadsheet, it's not an Excel file, obviously. Um, and there's so much data in it that um, the people found the service quite easy to use during the testing, but the, this upload thing was really confusing for them. Um, and depending upon how many people they found jobs for, some people filled in a spreadsheet with five rows. Some people had 10,000 rows. Some people uploaded hundreds of files. Some people uploaded one, so it was, it was quite complex. So we, they had to give it about 20, possibly 25 pieces of data about each person they found work for. Some of it was required, but more importantly, some of it was conditionally required. So this is the list. You had to have a forename and a surname, and put if you put a national insurance number in, you didn't need to tell us the date of birth or gender. But if you didn't have a national insurance number, you did need to give us them. And all of these kind of conditional things came out really quickly that hardly anybody could do this first time. All of this data is enshrined in, a, in an act of parliament. We have to ask for it by law. Um, the error message pattern that's in use now was still being developed, but it was mostly for filling in forms, like form fields. It wasn't really about telling people mistakes made in a spreadsheet that they've got over here. Um, I'm going to mention this pattern at least five times because, similar to something Henrik said, I cannot separate the content from the design in my head because if you have one without the other, you have, well, let's face it, either words that don't do anything or boxes on a screen. So in my head, content design is largely about the, how everything integrates together. So this is the pattern that we have now. This was what it looked like in July last year. As you can see, all the content doesn't actually say anything. It says things like message to alert the user here, optional description, error message goes here. So people were just writing really random error messages um, without really thinking about it. I have another presentation that I give called The Unhappy Content Designer, because I seem to spend loads of time looking at what we do when a page breaks and um, a service crashes. Instead of thinking, my service is beautifully simple and straightforward and no one's ever going to get an error. Everybody gets errors, it's just the way of life. So um, this has changed a couple of times, but the only real, in 2014, this was the only content guidance, which was, ensure error, ensure error messages make sense when read by screen readers, and error copy should be specific to the question and validation should identify all errors. I have a 15 minute talk about why we shouldn't have used the word copy, but that's possibly for another time. This was replaced in 2016 with write a message that helps the user to understand why the error occurred and what to do about it. But it still meant that you got loads of really random errors. So our pair wrote with another content designer who worked on a very similar service about what um, the error message should be. And um, we sat across a desk from one another and just read things to each other to make them sound natural and like human, like what you would say to somebody if you were talking to them. Um, so I had a hypothesis that no one was going to read our guidance and no one was going to read the report template. And when I'm designing stuff, I always have this thought in my head, which is going to sound like an insult, but it isn't. It's, would my mum know how to do this? Um, my mum is a very decent computer user, but whenever she gets a, something from the government, she essentially thinks I wrote it and it's my fault. Um, <laughs> so in January 25th, so we did loads of writing and testing and uh, with users and what we found was the pattern didn't work like we thought it wouldn't work because we were telling people about something that was wrong in an offline process um, and when someone did this for real 
that had 10,000 errors. I'm not sure where we could really show that in the red box pattern. Um, most, some users didn't read the guidance, just like we thought they wouldn't, because we had a lot of people who were like jumping in, people who jumped in with both feet rather than like spend time reading. And because what we were asking for, the error message needed to be mega specific, because it was things like, because you haven't given us a national insurance number, you must give us your gender or and date of birth. So there's lots of very verbose error messages. But we found the more specific they were, the easier people could fix the problems they had. And um, one of the key things we found was because they had to fix them in an offline process, turning them into instructions never worked. Saying enter your enter such and such, everyone went looking for somewhere to enter it. They didn't realise they had to go and do it elsewhere. So, um, and the biggest thing we found was we didn't know how to pass the word out across government because it was quite hard to do that in 2015. So in early 2016, I got moved on to tax credits, which is an incredibly lengthy service which lets you do all manner of things. When I was still in the service in mid-2017, if you included all of the branching logic through the journeys of the service and all of the workplace we would keep people out, there was 150 separate journeys in the service, and nine of them were just like changing your kid's name. So it's quite complicated. There was still no guidance about error messages, so I raised the I talked about it if you had say about no one really seemed to like think like have anything and so I did the thing which was the question Han Hinrich was asked. I just started doing loads of research. I read like seven, eight thousand posts on Medium, because there's loads of them. I looked at HMRC services, other government department services. I went on everything that I buy things from online and I am the person on a Friday night who goes on to services and leaves everything blank and clicks the button just to see what happens. Um, that's living the dream. Um, I looked at all the recommendations in blogs and style guides. I looked at the web content accessibility guides. I just went wild. I just looked for everything. But everything you found could be summarized in a few slides. Um, there was such ginormous variety of errors and recommendations. I like the word ginormous. Um, there was loads of inconsistencies within services and between services. It was quite marked how different they were. Um, there was government services not using the pattern. Uh, there was lots of general error messages that didn't really help anyone. It was things like an error has occurred and this field is required and really vague things. And a lot of private services use error messages as an extension of the tone of voice, which is a bit weird. Um, I have got so many examples of this because every time I do one of these, I start getting Slack messages off people and Twitter messages saying, look at this. So here's a few. So this is a, a field for your last name and the entry is, please enter a valid last name because someone's put in spaces. Like, I have a, f a person who sits behind me who did a talk today as part of Service Week, Mark O'Connor, gets this all the time because he's got an apostrophe in his name. And uh, I know when it happens at work because he just slams the lid on his Mac and just storms off and I'm like, he's had to type in O'Connor with an apostrophe there. <laughs> um, but can you imagine what telling someone their name is not valid means to them, what the history of their name, it's pretty awesome. This is a hard to find, but totally real Windows 2000 Service Pack 1 error. Your password must be at least 18,707 characters and cannot repeat any of your previous 30,689 passwords. Please type a different password. Type the password that meets these requirements in both boxes. I'm betting they're disabled copy and paste as well. Um, come on, you know this isn't a valid email. Um, you I can't remember what the service is from. It's from a major post board. Is that where you want to really tell jokes? Like, you don't know how, what this person's feeling when they're filling this in. Uh, my friend Craig, who works at AWP, was buying someone a present on kidly.co.uk, I think. And he's like me, he leaves fields empty just for laughs. So on one page, it goes from, please enter a recipient name, oops, you forgot to pop in your number, exclamation mark, don't be shy, to, though, we need to know where we're going. I mean, the inconsistency on one screen is pretty massive there, so, but again, you don't know what these people are feeling. But my personal fave, this is the Services Week hashtag from this morning. Uh, signing into Twitter, I've left a blank or I've typed in my name, and then you get taken to a brand new page with a modal box on the top that you can't access if you're using a screen reader or a keyboard. So there's no way you'll ever hear that if you're, posh, if you're using a screen reader and you can't see the screen. So that's pretty cool. Um, and this is a one from Civil Service Jobs. If you put a space in your password, you get there has been an error space. 
One of the fields you have entered contains invalid characters. Please click black and re-enter using only az09 underscore full stop at simple. I was reading that out like NVDA does. But it doesn't even tell you which one of the fields, so it's pretty, pretty nice. And this is the HMRC one. This is totally real. It doesn't do this anymore. But I'm not going to read it because I've tried five times to get from the foot front of the end on one breath, and I can't. But it's really hard to understand. So winding into March, we've decided to come up with some principles. We've based them on standard content design, inclusive design, accessible design, best practices. Um, it was to meet the, the one line of guidance we had in Elements at the time. We designed and tested loads of ideas based upon what I found out on the first service I worked on. Um, and what was really good was it confirmed the previous findings, the more specific the image is the better. General things like this field has required really confused people. Um, then moving forward in the story, um, in October 2016, March 2017, we worked across HMRC with a few different people to get their input. Um, then at ConCon 5 in March 2017, I did a talk about working with tax credits advisors and how they like ethnographic user researchers because they deal with 15 million calls a year, so they hear everyone's like actual problems. And I mentioned error message work to a couple of people who talked to us afterwards and they're like, I want that when you've done that. And I was like, brilliant. So April, October, uh, we produced a set of principles and standard errors, we shared them internally. I did a talk at ConCon 6 about it. I had 10 people come up to us and say, send me your document immediately. Go and get your computer, do it right now. I don't want to have to do this in my department. Uh, so this included People at GDS, DWP, Home Office, Ministry of Justice, DEFRA, Department for Education. And then I immediately started speaking with the GovDuk design team about it because HMRC has its own design library, but this didn't really feel like it belonged to us. It seems like outside of government. And all of our research shows nobody looks at our stuff internally if they think it's a general thing. So if they want to get how to capitalise unique taxpayer reference, they come to us. But when it's like a general thing, they don't. So. Um, so, November 17 to now, we've got some feedback from the people I shared the document with that all got sucked in. A special shout out to Amy Hoop in the design system team and Adam Silver at uh, Her Majesty's Court and Tribunal Service, who gave a lot of feedback about the errors. We also did a lot of the talking out loud together thing, which is quite embarrassing, really. But uh, we went, I spoke with the accessibility community in March 2018, that went down well. Did all of the updates based upon the feedback, got them published. Then we've published some standard error messages, and then we've added some more in December since. And these are to give people a start, just to start and hopefully make things better. I'm not saying these are like finalised and can never be touched and they should be etched in stone. This is just a place to start. So the principles quickly were, no matter how good an error message is about someone ever seeing it, I mean, is there such a thing as a good error message? I mean, I love the one, come on, you know, that's another an email, but I'm not sure if that really works in government. Um, but like we should allow different formats. If someone wants to put a space in their postcode, brilliant. But if they don't, we shouldn't, you know, discriminate against them. Um, don't have length restrictions or make people have maximum lengths in fields if we don't need to. Don't have character restrictions. Almost no government service lets someone type in their name with accents because of how backend systems work. So it says you must enter your name as it is on your passport, and then we don't let you. So it can be a bit weird. Um, my tip is I design my error messages at the same time as designing my content because then I don't just fill it in at the end because there are times when someone has said, Stephen, come and fill in the words because that, that still happens in government, it isn't a standard thing. Um, and I do read them out loud all the time. Only displaying error messages is the best thing to do. We had this concept where you can add a chart to your tax credits claim but they have to be a certain age. But if they typed in a totally valid date, that meant the kid was too old. If you gave them a validation message, they were stuck take them to a page what explains what's gone wrong and then give them an elegant way out of your service. Uh, be clear and concise, so tell them what's happened, tell them how to fix it, use plain English, be positive, get to the point. Don't say things like error zero x triple zero triple zero six four three or don't use humour. Lots of guidance online tells you to be funny. This is when levity would be a great boon to your users. Not if I'm doing my tax return at quarter to midnight on the 31st of January, it wouldn't be. Um, <laughs> Um, be consistent, have one way of doing, enter address line one, don't have five. And in our pattern we have like a summary at the top and an error at the field. Put the same error in each. No one cares that it's repetition except for content designers who say I don't want to repeat myself. We had one user mention it in you know, 25 user research sessions and all he said was, great, I know exactly what I've got to do. When we started seeing people changing them just for, to be have an elegant variation, 
some people didn't know they meant the same thing because they were phrased differently. And I would say, if you can write an error message in two ways, just pick the best one. Um, be specific, general errors never help people. You probably need to have different errors for different reasons. So if you've got like five validation rules, you probably need five errors. Well, you might not, but you could do like the one for, I hate it when it says enter a valid, enter a valid whatever, when I haven't entered anything. Um, and valid's bad anyway, what does it really mean? It means you have not met some format and restriction we have not even told you about. Uh, you can use instructions and descriptions, some things sound best. Enter address line one sounds better than address line one must have an entry. Um, but both, use both types, but fear the clarity over anything else. Track them, because if you do, you'll know exactly where people make mistakes and that means you can read it on your service. Or go back to your infrastructure lead and say, you know that field that we can't change, that because of that reason that someone wrote in 1997, can we change it because everyone fails on that? Um, it helps you do A-B testing as well and redesign and journeys and stuff. To go up the loop down, so to, use a, to a user, a service is simple. It's something that helps them do, to do something. Error message should help people do what they need to do uh, because everybody makes mistakes. Thanks.